Today we talk about our desires, and desires are complicated. Desires are not easily uh, delineated between good desires and bad desires. Good desires are complicated, complex, oftentimes uh, weaved together in the good and the bad, and how we can understand our desires is something that really requires God's help, God's discernment, His Holy Spirit to help us understand desires. Sometimes we Christians, we tend to think of the desires that lead us astray. And so we naturally think, well, desires must not all be good, so we repress desires. We try to put them away. We try to eliminate them as much as we can, and yet that is to deprive ourselves of our full humanity. God gave us desire. And so if God gave us desire, we're to express ourselves as uh, human beings with desires. And yet at the same time, we know that our desires can be also bad. And we can overindulge our desires, overexpress our desires, and make our desires into something that can be harmful. And so what do we do? What do we do with this complicated thing of our desires? Well, we're going to take a look at how the desires of our hearts can unfold into worldly desire. And we're going to see how that progression happens from desires that demand, desires that disregard, desires that delegate, and then desires that devour. This is the journey we're going on when you explore our desires that demand, disregard, delegate, and then devour. So first, worldly desires demand, demand. This tragic story all begins with Ahab coveting Naboth's vineyard. Ahab had at least two castles as the king of Israel. He had one in Samaria, and then he went, had one here in Jezreel. And if you consider the geography of the place, he had a wonderful view of things. This palace was grand. It was uh, amazing. And so Ahab naturally wants to make his palace even more amazing because right behind his palace wall is Naboth's vineyard. And what a wonderful addition that would be to the house, to the palace, if he could acquire this vineyard. And so he goes to Naboth with a pretty good offer. It's a reasonable offer if you just look at the economics of it. He says, Naboth, I will give you another vineyard, or I will pay you in silver for the value of your vineyard if you sell me your vineyard. Pretty reasonable, just economically. But Naboth says to Ahab in verse 3, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father's. No deal, Naboth says. And now how does Ahab respond? Verse 4, he goes into his house vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. This is the nature of worldly desires. Desire for a vineyard can, in itself can be a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But when that vineyard actually belongs to someone else, then you're starting to talk about desires gone bad, and that desire starts to demand. If it requires that you take something that belongs to somebody else, now your desires are starting to become demanding. Demands, demanding desires can look like two things. One, it can be, I'm going to grab and take it. I see this with my girls all the time, right? I'm going to grab and take but demanding desire can also look like sulking. And that's what Ahab does. Ahab sulks. He feels sorry for himself. He pouts. And so his desire for more doesn't necessarily have to look like, I'm going to go get it. It can look like, poor me. <laughs> that's what demanding desire can look like. And at this point, he's not murdering anybody. He's just pouty. But 
But it's good for us to think about our own desires and if we're sulking. Are we sulking over some unmet desires? Are we sullen? Are we just kind of huh, feeling sorry for ourselves because we didn't get what we want? Well, that can also be a demanding kind of desire. And so you, you do what Ahab did. You go to bed, you wrap your pillow around your head, and you say, poor me, right? Well, what we see in Naboth, though, is a real great contrast. He has godly desire. Naboth's response to Ahab, it's short, but it shows us so much about his own desire. Because he didn't just reject the offer of Ahab because it wasn't a good economic deal. He rejected the offer because of his devotion to God. Notice what he says again. He says, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. See, godly desires wants what you already have. What do I mean by that? When a husband says to his beloved wife, I want you. I want you. He is saying, you're mine, but I want you. I want to be close to you. I want to know you more. I want to be with you. I want to experience oneness with you. That's, that is wanting something that he already has. That's what Naboth's desire is like. He has God, and he wants what God already has given to him. He wants what he has. And so that's why he says, the Lord forbid. He starts with God. Because God is his ultimate desire. His ultimate devotion is to God. But not only is God his ultimate devotion, it's everything God gives within the good boundaries. He says, I should not give you the inheritance of my father's. And this is an echo, I think, of Psalm 16, 5 to 6, which says, The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. And then he says, The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. What is Naboth saying? Naboth is saying, My ultimate desire is God. My devotion is God. And... Because I have God, I also delight in everything God has given. That includes every opportunity God has given. God gave Naboth the opportunity to grow and cultivate a vineyard. And so he's rejoicing in that vineyard. He is growing that vineyard. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. But desire goes worldly when I want something that God has forbidden. When I want something outside of God, something that goes outside the pleasant lines that God has drawn up for me, that's when desires get worldly and demanding, right? So that's where we might find ourselves. We might find ourselves with some unmet desires, and then we ask ourselves, well, is this God saying to me that I just shouldn't have this, or am I trying to get something that God doesn't want me to have. I can either go and try to grab it and get it, or I can just sit and feel sorry for myself. That can be worldly desire. Because that worldly desire is demanding. It's still demanding. So that's the first, first progression. The step that we see Ahab take is it's a demanding kind of, kind of desire. He wants to go outside the lines that God has drawn for him. He wants the vineyard. God never said he could have the vineyard, but he wants it anyway. And that's how our desires can go worldly. Number two, worldly desire disregards God's word. Worldly desires disregards God's word. So picture Jezebel. It's dinner time. She's at the dinner table, and as she's about to sit and eat, she notices the seat across from the table is empty. And she asks the servants, where's the king? And the servant says, your majesty, the king has not left his bedroom. So Jezebel, the queen, goes up to the door, knocks on the door. Uh, Darling, Ahab, uh, 
What's wrong? No answer. She opens the door, and she sees Ahab lying down on the bed, and he's got his pillow wrapped around him, and just sees the back of his head. Why are you so vexed? Why don't you arise right now and come and eat? And this is what Ahab says. Well, because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. <laughs> now, that's not how Naboth actually replied. Naboth didn't say, I will not give you my vineyard. This is actually, what, what did he say? The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Right? Naboth is actually holding on to God's word, because God has said back in the Pentateuch, in Numbers 33, 30, 36, God taught Israel that the land of Canaan is actually his land, and that God is going to distribute his land to Israel as tenants in his land. And so when he distributes the land, he divides it up by tribes, and says, this tribe's going to live here, this tribe's going to live here, this tribe. And then he divides up the tribes into clans and families where they have specific areas that they will also live in on the land, on God's land. And so what is he then saying? Naboth is saying that God is the one who's distributed this land. And for generations and generations, we've been on this land that's been part of our family inheritance. And God has given it to us because God in his covenant love for us as his people has said, if you stay in your land, I will bless you. I'll bless your land. I'll bless your family. And so Naboth is saying, I am following the word of God given to us, to our forefathers and to me, that God will bless us as covenant people in this land if we stay in it. So I can't sell it. I can't sell it. He's honoring God's word. So when Ahab recounts to Jezebel what Naboth said, he doesn't even, it doesn't even register for him that God has told Naboth that he should not sell this inheritance. It doesn't at all. All Ahab hears is, here's Naboth and his desires to keep his vineyard. And it's competing with my desires to take his vineyard, and Naboth's desires are winning. That's, that's what happens when our desires become worldly. We disregard the word of God. We disregard what God may say about our desires, whether they are following in God's words or not. And this is what happens oftentimes, as, as it happened to Ahab, we too can filter out God's word and become indifferent to God's word because we want something so much. We want something so much. I'll give you an example. A man leaves his wife of 20 years and follows the same-sex attraction to be with another man. And he does so with disregard for what God says about marriage. And what does he do instead? He goes with that other man and he's, he then says, oh, the church is so judgmental and the church is so bigoted and the church is so homophobic and blah, 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 blah. So what is, what is the man doing? The man is saying, ah, the church is conflicting with my desires. But what has he done? He's actually disregarded what God has said about the covenant that he's made with his wife. He's disregarded the, the vows that he made before God. Right? This is what happens when our desires start to take a hold. We disregard what God says because we want to act on our desires so much. Right? So that's when worldly desires become demanding, right? And then disregards God's word altogether. Thirdly, Worldly desires began to delegate. Worldly desires delegate. And this is where you've got to be careful with who you marry. Right? Because here's Jezebel who steps in. Verse 7. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, 
uh, do you now govern Israel, Ahab? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. You know what's amazing? When our desires go worldly and we start getting demanding, we don't care about God's word, it's so amazing how those worldly desires are facilitated by people who start to come into our life who coalesce with those same desires, who have those, who match up in those same desires and offer us fulfillment of those desires. It's, it's alarmingly accessible to us that those people who would tempt us all of a sudden appear. <laughs> they're, they're right there. And this is exactly what Jezebel does for Ahab. She's right there to enable Ahab's desire for that vineyard. Now, it's because Jezebel also wants something. She desires to have a husband who is a powerful king. She doesn't want to be married to some weak, pathetic king. She wants a powerful king. And so she's going to enable this powerful king to get what he wants because that's what she wants. See, enablers find common agreement when they can find desires that match up with our own worldly desires. Isn't this true? You, have, you can find friends around you who will say yes to you no matter what your desires are, no matter what they are, because sometimes your desires help fulfill their own desires. Something about that matching happens. And so we have to be careful not to surround ourselves with people who are always saying yes to us. You don't want those folks in your life because those are the ones who enable, oftentimes, our worldly desires. Our worldly desires. So here's Ahab. He's sulking, but he is passively delegating his desires off to Jezebel. Ahab desires Naboth's vineyard. Jezebel wants a husband who acts like a powerful king. So she happily forges a letter, manipulates the leaders of the city to do her will, proclaims a fake fast so that the city will know there's something wrong. Because anytime the queen would, would say, hey, there's a, a fast, we all need to go on a fast, all the people would recognize, oh, there's something wrong. Some, some, there's got to be a reason why the queen just called us to a fast. There's something wrong. And so the whole city, all the leaders, they follow in being manipulated by her, and they call for the fast. They put Naboth there, front and center, in the middle of the fast. And then it says, do you notice the word? Find two scoundrels, or your translation might say two worthless fellows, two guys who will do anything for money, basically, and have them bring false charges against Naboth. And what would be the false charges? Uh, that Naboth cursed God and cursed the king. She's enabling, right? She's taking those desires and acting on them. Bad friends. Bad friends do that. What do faithful friends do? Faithful friends call us out on our worldly desires. Faithful friends will say, uh... I think your desires are about to go south right here because faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? Friends are willing to say things that might hurt and make Ahab sulk even more. But faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's the kind of friends that we need to have. So let's pause for a minute right here before we get into the last point here. What I don't want us to take away from this is that we can easily divide desires into good and bad. Because it's, like I said, it's more complicated than that. Uh, I had a conversation with someone this past week, and it's a conversation that I've had many, many times with people. But the conversation goes like this. If someone wants to talk with me about a, a problem. I listen, I pay attention, I validate the struggle, I empathize with them, and then I affirm that God is with them in the midst of that. Now, 
oftentimes a person will respond and and recognize that that even my presence, the way that I'm responding to them in the struggle, is something they wish that their earthly parents had done for them. I am somehow con prompting a longing in their heart to have heard their father or their mother act like this with them in their pain. And they never had that earthly father or mother who actually would hear them and pay attention to them and empathize with them in their pain. And so there's a choice that that person can make right then in that, in that moment. All of a sudden, that longing to hear their earthly father's voice affirming them and blessing them, it's now there. But now what do they do with that desire? That desire is not a bad desire, right? It's not a bad desire to long for your earthly father and mother to affirm you and empathize with you and pay attention to you and see you and know you, but it's what you do next. Oftentimes there will be one direction is to go and chase some bad relationship with some person who just gives you the time of day, who, who pays attention to you somewhat. And you say, oh, that is like an echo of the longing I have for my earthly father. And what do you do? You settle for that. You settle for that relationship. And it ends up being a bad relationship. It ends up being toxic to you. But you, you bought into it because it was an echo of a deeper desire that you had to have your father's affirmation or your, your mother's affirmation in your life. Or some people, they... they feel that longing for that earthly father's affirmation and voice, and then they just flat out reject all relationships altogether. And so you can't get close to them. Can't get close, because now there's a wall. It's like, no, I'm not going to set myself up to try to get that desire fulfilled, because the people who should have fulfilled it, my parents, they never did it. So if my parents didn't do it, nobody's going to do it. So they shut the desire off altogether. You see? Is that, you following with me? But here's, here's what I try to, when I start to recognize that that person is experiencing something that they have not experienced in a long time, just from me being with them, I then take them to the next step, which is, you know the longing that you have right now that's starting to prompt up in your heart? You're experiencing that kind of attention and affirmation. You know what that is? Yes, it's it is a longing for your parent to have done that in your life. But it's, that is even an echo of a deeper longing to hear the voice of your Heavenly Father. So you're, that person's parent might have died, might have passed away. And so the, the opportunity to hear that from your father or your mother is gone, but it doesn't take away the fuller experience that that longing really is and that is a longing to hear the voice of your beloved father saying to you, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. And that's the ultimate place where we find our desires fulfilled. Make sense? And so that's, that's where we take those desires. So instead of just trying to categorize desires as bad or good, we could take a good desire like that and recognize that it could go good or it could go bad, but the, the key there is to understand that that desire, whatever it is, will only ultimately be fulfilled in God. He is my ultimate desire. And I can experience some, some fulfillment of desire here in this life, but my heart's desire can only be fulfilled through something that is eternal. The writer of Ecclesiastes said that, right? God has placed eternity in our hearts. My ultimate fulfillment can only be found in someone who is eternal. And that's why Augustine said that our hearts are restless until we find our rest in thee, O God. So that's what we do with our desires. We do this with our desires where we say, I could even go, I love chicken parmesan. Anyone? Yes, right? You go to Original Joe's, you order a chicken parmesan, and oh, it's so good. And it's 
Oh, wonderful, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's such a great treat. And then you taste it, and it, it makes you realize, oh, yeah, my heart is full. That is so good. And then you go away, and that fulfillment goes away. And then you realize, ah, I could either keep eating chicken parmesan and load up on really cheesy, oily stuff like that for days and days and days, trying to feed that ache, or I can just say, Ah, oh, the delight of that chicken parmesan satisfied me for a while, but it points me to a greater, more eternal satisfaction that I have in God. See? That's what we ought to do with those desires so that they become good desires. Good desire points that, that taste that I get of, of having some desires fulfilled, and it prompts me to recognize, oh, there is an ultimate fulfillment that I have when I desire God. You know, that's why the psalmist said in Psalm 27, one thing I ask, one thing I seek, that I may see you, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, that I may dwell in your sanctuary. This is my ultimate desire. And if you look at Psalm 27, it's, it's a psalm full of desire. It's a psalm full of longings. But he says in the middle of that psalm, one thing I ask, one thing I seek. I just want to gaze at the beauty of God because that's where my ultimate fulfillment is. See? And that's what we do with our desires. So our desires are good. Even the desires to do bad are, are an expression of a longing to know God. Ah, oh, there's a quote in my... J.K. Chesterton said that a person who knocks on the door of a brothel is wanting to know God. It's that desire, even the desire that goes bad, is really a desire that needs to be redirected, reordered towards God. Because even the bad desires are a reflection that I want something that can only be satisfied in God. Only be satisfied in God. A person knocking on the door of a brothel is still seeking God. Seeking God in the wrong places, but it's still a desire for God, right? So that's where we need to understand that desires are not so easily bifurcated. It's not a binary thing, good and bad, but it's what we do with them that can be good or bad, right? And recognizing that our ultimate desire is fulfilled by God. I can have the desire to go to church, Today, you had a good desire, and you could say, that's a good desire. Go to church. Or you could have had a desire to go to the baseball game today, right? And you could say, oh, that's a bad desire because that takes me away from church. Well, a lot of people had desires to go to church, and then all of a sudden they find themselves harmed by church, right? A lot of people have been harmed by church. So they've experienced spiritual abuse in church, and so here's a good desire to go to church, and then all of a sudden... What happened? Baseball game, might say that's a bad desire if I should go, go to church, but you know what, at a baseball game, you do actually meet some cool people. You do get to experience some delight. You do get to experience some things that are actually good. So bad desire, it's complicated, isn't it? But it's what we do with it. It's what we do with it. The good desire, the bad desire, what do we then do with it? If we can direct those desires from wherever they start, back to God and say, God, you're the one thing I ask. You're the one thing I seek. You're the only one who can fulfill the ultimate desire of my heart. Now we understand that our desires, no matter where they start, can be good, can be good. Because I find truth, I find goodness, I find beauty that my heart is longing for, designed for, only in the one who satisfies that. Right. So number four. Now we get to the last point. But I wanted to get to all of that before we get to the real end progression of this. Number four, worldly desires devour. When the queen called for a fast, the nation knows something's wrong. Two scoundrels rise up, accuse Naboth of cursing God and the king, and they take Naboth out and stone him to death. As soon as Jezebel hears about this from the two scoundrels, 
She goes up to Ahab and says, hey, arise, take possession of the vineyard, be the powerful king that you need to be so we could be a powerful couple that we need to be. You go take that vineyard, which he refused to give to you because he's dead. He's dead. Ahab, you know, he could, he could just say, you know what, all I did was sulk. I didn't do anything, <laughs> right? But he did everything. His sulking gave the delegating to his proxy, Jezebel. And so he is just as guilty as anyone. And as soon as he hears it, he goes down, takes the vineyard. Devours. That's what, de that's what desires do when they're unleashed. They start losing, you lose your moral compass altogether. And you start taking, 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 taking until you devour. You devour. And that's where we see Elijah. The word of the Lord comes to Elijah. Remember Elijah? Remember we saw Elijah also sulking under a broom tree? Remember that? Which tells us a little bit about how, you know, sometimes we don't see good people and bad people. It's complicated, right? It's complicated. All of us have the potential to be an Ahab. Elijah sulked as well. But God restored Elijah. And what we see here is that God gives Ahab an opportunity for restoration too, even after all of his desire, devouring. But let's, let's get there first. God speaks to him and says, this is what you need to go and tell Ahab. You've killed. You've taken possession. And in the place where dogs licked up the, licked up the blood of Naboth, so shall dogs lick up your blood. And so what happens is, Worldly desires, it devoured Naboth. It devours the people that we take from, but it ends up devouring ourselves. It leads to our own death, is what happens. And so Ahab, Elijah comes up to Ahab, and Ahab looks at Elijah and says, You, this guy. And if you remember the last time Ahab greeted Elijah, he said, You, troubler of Israel. Remember? And here he says this, have you found me, O oh, my enemy? O oh, my enemy. He's looking at Elijah as the enemy. The truth of the matter is that Elijah was probably the best friend he had. Because Elijah was the one guy in his life who was willing to tell him the truth. And he calls him an enemy. And this is what desires do when they go south. We can't tell friend from foe anymore. Our foe becomes our friend. Our friend becomes our foe. And this is what happens to Ahab. He's all messed up. And so Elijah answers him and says in verse 20, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I'll utterly burn you up. I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me, and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And any one of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heaven shall eat. This is the word of judgment that comes against Ahab because of his worldly desires. Because of his worldly desires. This whole story illustrates beautifully what James the Apostle said about desires. In James 1, 14 and 15, listen to this. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, desire, when it is conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death see the progression the progression of worldly desire gone bad that then is conceived there's temptation you're enticed you got jezebels in your life who will present you the opportunity to follow through on those desires conceive the desires and you start devouring and it leads to death demanding, disregarding God's word, delegating out your desires to, to bad friends, 
and then devouring. And who gets devoured in the end? God's word said, it's you, Ahab. It's you. But here's, the, here's a wonderful thing. We don't find in James, but we find in the gospel. And that is this. Ahab, he hears what Elijah says, and he humbles himself. He repents in a way. What he does is he put on sackcloth, and he starts, it says in the scriptures, that he starts walking around the palace softly, meekly. He realizes that God has rendered judgment on him, and he actually starts regarding God's word again, and he's sobered by God's word, and he realizes he's about to lose everything because of God's word. But then God does the unimaginable and says to Elijah, have you seen Ahab? you seen how he's humbled himself? Have you seen how he's repented? Go tell Ahab that all the judgment that I said was due you, I'm going to delay it. It's not going to come upon you in your lifetime. It's going to come upon your sons. But not on you in your lifetime. Now, that is unimaginable mercy, isn't it? Here is Ahab. God's word has said he's the worst king ever in Israel. Ever. No one's been more wicked than Ahab. And yet, what a mercy. What a mercy that comes to him because he humbled himself. Now, we know that Ahab's repentance here is not really complete repentance. His repentance, if it was complete, he would have said, Whoa, I'm going to give back Naboth's vineyard. I'm going to restore God, the worship of God throughout the land of Israel. We're going to do this right. We're going to start all over again, and we're going to turn our hearts back to God. And he never does that. He never does that. What we see is Ahab is sorry, but he's just really sorry for the consequences. He's sorry for the judgment that he is now rendered. Right? That's what he's sorry about. He's not sorry that he offended God. He's not sorry for the grief and the rebellion that he has rendered against God. And this is the difference between David and Ahab. Remember David did something similar here? He didn't, it wasn't about a vineyard, it was about a woman. David saw beautiful Bathsheba and wanted her and ordered the execution of her husband so that he could have Bathsheba. Remember that? That's bad. Wow. Terrible. But what does David's response when he hears, you're the man, you're the one. What is David's response? Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil against in your sight, he says. Who, where is the grief that David has? Is it just in the consequences of his sin? No, he realizes that my sin is against God. I have violated God. And we know that David was a man after God's own heart. So what grieves David more than anything else is that he has grieved God. Ahab doesn't have that kind of grief. He's only sorry that he got caught, and he's only sorry that he's had to deal with the consequences. That's the kind of grief that leads him to a certain kind of humility, but not complete repentance, right? But it was there for him. What a mercy, again, if he had fully repented, if he had fully acknowledged that his sin was against God, and that God is a God who would be kind to him if he fully embraced him, but he couldn't do it because his worldly desires were too strong. This is, a, this is such a cautionary tale for all of us, but I hope it takes us to understand our desires in a way that we can say that at any step along the way, if our desires are demanding, or they become disregarding of God's word, or they are delegating out, or they're devouring, that at any step along, those way, along the way, we can redirect our desires back to God, and we will find a God who is kind and merciful, and forgiving, and willing to reorder our desires so that our desires can match his desires. What a merciful God. What a kind God who would do that. And his Holy Spirit is the one who would do that, who would reorder our desires to love the things that God loves again. 
Well, just to close, we're about to go to the communion table. Like Naboth, there is someone who owned a vineyard, but it was the vineyard of God's people. And like Naboth, there was someone who was envied by the leaders of the land. And like Naboth, there was someone who was falsely accused and slandered and put on trial. And then there was someone who was ultimately killed. But in his death, we find him taking on the death that we deserved for our worldly desires. And that someone is Jesus. Jesus was the ultimate Naboth. Jesus is the one who actually took upon himself all the consequences of our worldly desires, and he bore it upon the cross, and he died so that we can be forgiven, we can be cleansed, and we can be new creations in Christ, made alive to God, who is our ultimate desire, and who gives us his desire. That's Jesus, the ultimate, the ultimate Naboth. What a savior. What a savior. So what a beautiful thing it is that even right now, wherever our desires are, if we go to the one who died on the cross to take upon himself the judgment for all of our worldly desires, that we will find a God who is willing to forgive us and redirect our desires towards him, even right now. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for bearing the death that we deserved for our worldly desires. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace that works within our hearts so that our desires can be transformed, reordered, redirected into the desires that you have. Lord, we ask that you would do that work right now. And as we come to the foot of your cross and we remember what you did, by giving us yourself, that, Lord, in the remembering, your Holy Spirit would do that deep work within our desires to desire you ultimately and let your Spirit do the work of reordering our desires. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.